Orbits is this initiative that we've been running at UCL for, or correct, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, Jonathan, um, for about eight years. Uh, so Orbits originally stood for original research by young Twinkle scientists. Um, so Twinkle is a space a spacecraft that was um, led from UCL and organized and is being um, currently built, managed, managed and uh, I guess pioneered and, and trailblazed by people from UCL. Um, and within it, there was um, a strong outreach drive and a strong drive to support diversity in science. Um, and so from that stemmed these research with school partnerships. So these are pairings of researchers with schools to enable the school students to undertake research. Um, I should shout about this award because I'm not as good at self-promotion uh, for the program as, as I should be. So we were really fortunate to win the NEON award this year. So these are national education awards and we won the award for widening access to education. Um, so to start, I guess, what's the motivation for this? And, and there are two huge issues currently um, with UK, UK physics. Um, the first is that we have extreme teacher shortages. So about one in seven schools in the UK don't have a physics teacher at all. So that's uh, 500 UK secondary schools don't have a physics teacher. And actually there's less than, on average, less than one teacher per school across the UK. Um, and this this has really driven this this cycle where you have not enough physics teachers, so not enough people being inspired to do physics, so there's not enough physics undergraduates, so there's not enough physics teachers, and we've been trapped in this loop. And it, it leads to the situation where at GCSE, so that's about when you're 15 or 16 years old, currently you're less likely to learn physics in the UK, to be taught physics in the UK by a physics teacher than you are by a biology teacher, let alone chemistry teachers, maths teachers, design technology teachers who are roped into teaching the subject. And this has further problems because in education, the only thing that's been shown to um, be correlated with student success is, is the specialist knowledge of their teacher. Um, there are probably lots of other correlations, but that's the only one that's been proven. Uh, and so currently we're in a situation where there are 30% less A-level physics students in the UK than there were way back in the 1980s. There are about 35,000 at the moment, and in the 1980s, there were around 50,000. Um, so that's problem number one. Problem number two, two is one that you're probably very familiar with within the Women in Physics group, and that's that um, there are just chronic diversity issues across the board in physics. Uh, so from age 16 in the UK, only 20% of the cohort's girls, and that shifts from a 50% 50, 50, uh, 50 of the cohort being girls at GCSE to, to cutting straight down to 20%. At, at the crossover point as, you, as soon as you switch from 16 to 17 basically years old. Um, and there are huge problems with, um, with diversity and representation across ethnicity as well, um, as shown by these statistics. And so this leads to situations where, and particularly this stems from the, phys from the lack of physics teachers, because of this lack of physics teachers, schools aren't able to set, and exam boards aren't able to set um, exams that are particularly interesting. So you end up with exams that are just rote learning. And then the nature of the exams drives the way in which physics is taught. Um, and so if you just have rote learning of um, writing a definition for something or writing a formula onto an exam, then you end up with that being the way that it's taught in schools. Um, and this is just kind of a systemic, I mean, it's the nature of the system, right? You you generate an exam and you judge the success of students by an exam. And so teachers teach in a method that suits that exam. And again, we're trapped by the situation where we don't have enough physics uh, physicists in the UK. So there aren't enough people to um, mark exams. And so the exams have to be set to be um, relatively formulaic. And so that leads to students in schools thinking that physics is typically, and science generally is typically really formulaic and very much about rote learning. It lacks creativity. Um, it's not very sociable or human because they don't get to see those aspects of it. Uh, kids say it's boring. All of these are quotes that we, we've had from um, baseline studies at the start of orbits where we've asked students what they think. Um, it's too hard on not Einstein. This is maybe the biggest problem for addressing uh, diversity issues in science. Um, so we have this person who um, was obviously an incredible influence on physics um, in the form of Einstein, um, but and it's very much synonymous with the subject, um, but because they're kind of synonymous with the subject because of their 
very, very high innate level of intelligence. And that really puts off a lot of people. And the, one of the biggest factors that, that limits diversity in physics is confidence. And addressing confidence issues should be at the forefront of, of our goals in terms of um, when we go to schools and when we try and convince school students that they can actually be scientists. Um, problems, yeah, again, around diversity um, and also problems around careers. So there's a big drive at the moment in outreach, and I'm, I'm not necessarily entirely for this, to really promote STEM um, and, and to show school students STEM careers. And all, this happens almost exclusively. Um, and so I think the problem here is a misunderstanding because at, if you want to work with school students who are from backgrounds that typically haven't gone into science before, let's, let's talk initially about those from low income backgrounds. Then typically parents who have a school student, who have a, who have a child who does well in school will push for that child to do um, business or medicine or law. And so advertising science careers exclusively at the cost of, of the breadth of science and its, um, and its benefit to careers, I think is a dangerous path for us to take. Okay, so finally some things that I think, if you take nothing else from these talk, uh, from this talk, I would say that these are the things that we've learned from Orbit over the last four years and the things that you should really try to do if you ever end up talking to school students. Okay, so first of all, you should not promote exceptionalism. So I really think that a, a significant problem at the moment in, in UK science is that when it, so it's kind of lauded um, and, and considered a success that we send astronauts to schools and that school students get to meet astronauts. But the problem is that school students understand that by definition an astronaut, for instance, is someone who is exceptional and so whose talents are not accessible for the vast majority of people. And this ends up promoting science to the 1% rather than the 99%. And I think we've got into a habit of promoting exceptionalism rather than promoting the relatable. And I would really encourage you to, to try and shift away from this and to try to promote the relatable um, rather than the exceptional. Uh, so I think this, this kind of second bullet point here is built into that, that when you go into schools, you should really talk about, it's gonna be pretty clear that you're, that you're a successful scientist like you will have the credibility and the authenticity of coming from, for instance, UCL um, and doing a PhD or having done a PhD and every and all of the credibility that that brings. But what's less clear for school students is your fallibility and the mistakes that you've made and the failures you've had on the way. And I think it's really important that they see that because, again, it, it breaks this Im impression that we have that we've built into society that science is something that can only be done by exceptional people. So talk about your failures. I would really encourage you to talk about the times that you've made mistakes, the times that you failed to get to somewhere um, and to build that into your talk. Um, I've already talked about the ex exclusive promotion of STEM careers. Um, a lot of the literature is now showing that one of interventions, so this means like when you go and visit a school for a single instance and you give a talk at the school, those interventions have almost no long-term impact on the school students. And really what you want to do is visit them multiple times so that they get to actually know you as a person. And again, it breaks this barrier of seeing scientists as these like <laughs> crystallized beings that like are inaccessible. So rather than do five different talks to five different schools, I would really encourage you to do five talks to the same school. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty clear and pretty well covered that you should present diverse role models in, in your talk. Um, so you'll hear a lot in, in terms of outreach and education about um, how it's really important to raise aspirations. I strongly disagree with, with the framing of this. Um, I don't believe that poor people need their aspirations raising. Uh, and my, my not believing this is based on um, going back and reading the literature. And if you read the literature from the 1990s that promoted this idea that aspirations need raising for the working class, people, you'll find that it's based on a, a very strong hierarchy of aspirations where university attendance is, is deemed to be a higher aspiration than some other things. Um, I think that that framing is, is a dangerous one where, where we think of these things as 
in, in sort of a hierarchical sense as raising. So what I would encourage instead, there, there is very definitely a need to present new pathways um, and different pathways to people from lots of different backgrounds. And, in, and so instead of looking to raise aspirations, I would encourage you to think about um, just demonstrating accessible pathways in science and showing that there are extra routes that people can take and making sure that it's clear what, what path and what route you can do to do that. Uh, another problem that, that is really ingrained in outreach is that you go to a school and you just give a talk and you just talk at the students. And again, this takes away the idea that the students can be directly involved in science. And so what I would, I would encourage is to try and give the students a sense of agency, by which I mean give the students a sense of, of ownership over the direction that that talk takes. So rather than you telling them things and acting as an authority or as someone exceptional who, who speaks at them about this thing, try to give them ownership of the direction of the talk. Um, COVID generally has been considered a, a terrible thing for education, there, but there are some positives that we can take from it. And um, particularly, I would encourage you to utilize the anonymity that, that, for instance, remote sessions like this offers. So again, coming back to this idea that confidence is a big blocker for students getting into, um, getting into science and considering science an accessible pathway for them. Um, the fact that you can do polls and they don't have to attach their name to it, that they can ask questions without um, fearing being wrong or fearing being um, judged for the question they've asked, I think is a really powerful tool that helps to break that confidence barrier and helps to make science more accessible. So I, even if we go back to in-person sessions, I would really encourage the use of some of these tools, uh, things like Padlet or Mentimeter and things like that, that would and, and Slido that will let students ask questions without having to attach their, themselves to the question that they're asking. Um, finally, that I think there's lots of research with school, research in schools is normally the term that's used. And so I'm trying to distinguish this here by saying research with schools. And I think this disting distinction is important. So there are some really great models out there, like the Institute for Research in Schools, um, that seeks to teach teachers how to do research and that, so that they can support the school students. I think as an ideal, that's fantastic. And we should, wherever possible, be supporting the teachers. The problem is that it misunderstands the, the context of, of society as a whole and the fact that a lot of schools don't have a physics teacher at all in their department, or if they have a physics teacher, on average, they have one. So for those schools, that physics teacher runs physics for the whole school. And they, it's very, very unlikely that they can find time away from their timetable to devote to things like that. And we hear this unanimously from all 30 of our school partners that though the teachers doing orbits can only do orbits because they're supported by a researcher, that they themselves would not have time and also have confidence issues that would prevent them from going away and doing this. So I think a lot is to be said for, for the role of partnering the schools with the researcher to do these things. Okay, that was a lot, a lot of waffle, but if you take nothing else from the talk, I would ho hope that you take some of these things and, and, and maybe think about how you could introduce them in your own outreach. Okay, so what is Orbitz? So Orbitz is a partnership between schools and researchers. Um, we partner up schools with a researcher and the goal is that they empower the school students in the school to undertake research. Um, we particularly try to work with um, students from groups that have been historically excluded from science and with schools that have low numbers of science teachers. Uh, so here's Clara, she was a PhD student at UCL uh, working with Jonathan. Um, and uh, she went to Hyams Park School uh, in North London, which is a low socioeconomic area in North London. Um, and when she started this program, she partnered with these school students, along with um, some of her colleagues, Laura McKemish, Katie Chubb, <coughs> uh, and others. And she got the school students doing exomort research. Um, so I would normally give <laughs> a very rough overview that I'm sure Jonathan would be disgusted by as to what exomort is. Um, but loosely, I would say that the school students um, work on finding certain quantum numbers um, for certain molecules, and then they manipulate those numbers in order that they can be utilized the XML architecture to generate line lists. Um, so things like carbon monoxide, which it blows my mind that we didn't have a complete line list for. Um, we had school students working on carbon monoxide to try and build, to try and work out where do the spectral lines for carbon monoxide lie. Uh, and they did that within. And so um, 
I would say that ExoMOL and the Marvel project that spins out of ExoMOL and, and works with the school students has been a, a colossal success for the program and that it's led to, I think, uh, five publications, but maybe six, um, where the school students have done things, uh, have, have explored the, these quantum numbers and, and the spectral lines associated with certain molecules and been able to generate um, line lists that didn't exist previously, and so those have been published. Uh, so how does the program actually work? So the PhD student or the postdoc pairs up with the school and they'll visit the school once a week, maybe once a fortnight, depending on the school timetable, um, for approximately between an hour and an hour and a half from November to late fall. And during that time, they'll work with a group of around 10 school students sometimes. Uh, so here's, here's an example of uh, Jasmine and Andy who paired up to work with, I think, 25 school students for their group. Um, they work with a, a small-ish group of school students on a research project. And the school students will be performing original research. And the lof lofty goal is that the, the research that the school students are working on contributes towards a publication. Um, at the start of the program, in uh, at the end of October or the start of November, we have a launch event uh, that happens, <laughs> used to happen in person at UCL. Uh, I guess we'll see how that goes for this year. In fact, we I know that we won't be able to do it before January. Um, but so in the launch event, the school students will come to UCL, they have tours around UCL um, and they meet uh, some of the lecturers and stuff. Um, and then there's a closing conference at the end that bounds the program. And this is where it kind of comes full cycle, right? The school students first turn up, they see professional scientists pre present doing presentations. Um, and then at the end, they become kind of the pro professional scientists doing a presentation at a closing conference. Um, and so this is, I think it's kind of a cool event. Like we have 200, maybe 300 school students in a lecture theater and they're presenting um, their results, or at least that's how it happened pre-COVID, obviously now, instead we split it into four different um, Zoom conferences uh, and the school students presented at each of those Zoom conferences. And so we had somewhere between 60 and 100 people on each of those Zoom conferences. Um, in terms of designing a project, the researcher has total autonomy, but I, I feel like now having seen, I think I've overseen somewhere around 70 projects now being delivered. Um, and so having done that, I'm, I guess my role in this is to try and support you with producing your projects and to make sure that you're comfortable with it and that it would be accessible to the school students. So I'm here to support as much as is needed um, and as much as you'd like support. But, but really, I also don't want to get in the way and, and I'm conscious that we're all really busy people. So you, you have as much autonomy as you need and I'm here to support, I guess. And we've done projects on so many different things now. Um, so a huge number on, on ExoMOL and generating those line lists. Um, but in terms of astro, loads of astrophysics projects, so exoplanets, black holes, and, and active galactic nuclei, imaging Mars, space plasma, aurora, things that I really actually thought would be really difficult for school students to get involved with and have turned out to, act to actually still really inspire them and still have a, a colossal impact. And, and importantly, they've been able to directly impact on the research. So things like um, machine learning, there's been a bunch of machine learning projects more recently, and I'll show a video of some students talking about one of theirs, one of their machine learning projects at the end. Um, yeah, supernovae, spectroscopy, lo lots and lo lots of different topics. There doesn't really seem to be a topic that we can't find some way to, to introduce. Um, okay, so what actual impact is this having? And what size? I think we're, we're coming up to 30 schools. Um, we had 28 on the program this year. Um, and what do those schools report? So encouragingly, we see 100% increases in the uptake of, of post-16 STEM subjects by girls. So for instance, uh, one of the schools we work with is an all girls school. Um, and prior to orbits for the previous six years, they'd had four girls doing A-level physics. And now since orbits, they've had 10 girls doing A-level physics two years in a row. Uh, so the, these numbers are really small, right? We're talking about, we're, we're comfortably in Poisson statistics where we're talking about four to 10 people across, I don't know, like a, a handful of different schools, but it seems like there's indications that maybe this is having a positive impact. Um, we see um, the vast majority of students who do orbits projects go on to take STEM subjects at, uh, at A-level and beyond. Um, We've had schools report that their students scored in the top 1% value added. So that means that their growth in grades from GCSE to A-level um, put them, yeah, in the top 1% in the UK. 
Um, and since 2018, we've had more than 150 school students publish papers. Um, I should say that of the schools involved in the program, so of the 14 papers I think we now have published, um, 13 of the schools involved uh, were state schools. Um, and the vast majority of the students who are on the papers come from low income backgrounds. Um, and probably from groups that would historically have been excluded from science. Uh, and promisingly, we also, until pre-COVID, we had 100% teacher retention. We, I'm, I'm hoping that we're not breaking this, but one of the one, a couple of the schools on the program had to take a year off for COVID. Um, but hopefully this is an indication again, that this model of pairing up schools with researchers and getting the school students involved in research is having a positive impact on both the teachers and the schools and the school students. Uh, here are some example publications um, from Marvel XML papers to exoplanet papers to X-ray papers to molecular spectroscopy to imaging of Mars um, and press releases and stuff like that. Um, I think I just want to dwell on this very briefly. I think there's a real opportunity that's been presented by this kind of promotion of research note papers. So a research note is a non-peer reviewed paper and it's often very short. It's only 1500 words and it typically is limited to one figure or table. Um, and critically as well, it includes the possibility of null results. So what I've been encouraging people to think about when they're designing their orbits projects is whether they can build it around a research note uh, because it's quite a short paper to publish. So we published this one two days ago, I think, um, with a group of school students and they were looking at um, spectral lines from black holes. Uh, so the partner researcher, Sam, um, he built some Python code that would just let them fit um, Gaussian lines to a spectrum, basically. So he, he generated all these spectra from AGN, and then he got the school students to try and fit spectral lines to them and see what spectral lines fitted. And then they measured like the winds from the black hole and things like that. Um, so I think this um, very much, um, no, I'm actually not going to say that. I'm going to move on. Okay, so <laughs> what do teachers gain? So uh, hopefully it's clear that the school students are gaining lots of things. Teachers report to us lots of things. Uh, here's a, a lovely quote from a partner teacher, Declan Fleming. He's a chemistry teacher at one of our partners. Um, he says that, for instance, Orbitz is a real get out, of the, get out of bed in the morning kind of project. It's one of the coolest things he's ever used the whiteboard for. Um, it changed his teaching to his... Uh, to his school students all the way down the school and he utilized lots of the concepts that he he found in orbits to teach um to teach curriculum science in new ways um lots of other staff have become involved and it's spread into the wider uh, school community and i probably should have highlighted this orbits is definitely one of the coolest things i've been exposed to in my 15 year career uh, so we think that it probably is building teachers professional development as well so that you're not just when you're partnering with the school students you're not just impacting those 10 school students in a very meaningful and profound way you're impacting the teacher as well and they're taking those ideas and they're introducing them across the whole school um a lot of these schools and i've said this <laughs> i feel like i'm repeating myself but it's a, a problem worth repeating because we are so short of physics teachers and so many schools don't have a physics teacher Often you are the only subject specialist that those physics teachers or people who have to teach physics, even though it's not their subject specialism, you're probably the only subject specialist that they'll have access to. Um, it gives them a chance to do science, potentially again, if they, if they have PhDs, but most of the schools we work with don't. Um, so for some of them where they've just gone from undergraduate and maybe didn't do physics at undergraduate, and then they've gone straight into teaching, um, they may have never actually done science research. And I think a lot of them find a deeper love for science through these projects. And, uh, and just to highlight this again, I think this doesn't work without the partnership model because of the minimum time, minimal time commitment that you're asking for from the teachers. We demand that the teachers are in every session, but other than them making sure that the students are there, we don't ask them to do any extra preparation. If they want to do extra stuff, great. And if they take lots of extra things from it, great. But Critically for these schools, it's important that we're not draining extra time from the teacher. Um, so what do researchers gain? Um, so first and foremost, Orbitz isn't a program that's just about outreach. You're not having to take time out of your 
out of your research to, to go and do outreach that has no benefit. It's a symbiosis between the two. You are doing your research in a classroom rather than doing it in your office, basically. Um, and so because of this, all of the direct presentation of, of your research that you do will feed back into how you, for instance, communicate your ideas at conferences or in proposals. Um, and so in that sense, I think, I think there are very few programs that probably give you as rigorous and real communication training as this. Like, you, you get a really brutal feedback loop where you explain something and you thought you really smashed it and you nailed it and you explained it really well one week and you come back the next week and you realize the kids have no idea what you're talking about. If you just go to a school once and you do a one-off outreach thing, you never get that, you never get that feedback loop. Equally, when you do a conference presentation and there's that eerie silence across the room, you, you again don't get that feedback loop. This is a chance to really hone the way that you, ex you explain concepts and ideas. Um, and I think for universities that provides future lecturers who have extensive pedagogical experience and, and really understand how to teach their, their subjects and how to teach their research. Um, it gives you projects and people and, and leadership slash management training that probably I think is largely unavailable for PhDs and, and for postdocs as well. Um, there's probably not, <laughs> there's unlikely to be as good management training as trying to convince a group of 15 or 16 year olds um, how to do this science or to do it and to understand all their motivations and then to utilize and, and to motivate them <laughs> with that understanding of them. Um, I think all of those things are fundamentally leadership and management training that you just won't have access to outside of, of this sort of program uh, within a PhD, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to be corrected on this. I, I personally wouldn't have had access to it on my PhD. Um, it gives you new perspectives on your research. I think, I mean, you'll hear people say this a lot, but I really do think that I have personally come up with new paper ideas from directly delivering projects because of questions kids have asked. Um, we can pay you if you're a PhD student, we pay you 18 pounds an hour. Um, although we have limited funding, so we can pay you for up to two hours of preparation and two hours of delivery per session. Um, and, and I guess the real reason for doing it is that it's a chance to genuinely change the lives of young people. Um, I'm gonna whip through these really quickly, but I just wanted to showcase again, like the diversity of different research topics that we've covered. So, Jasmine and Andy and Maria all introduced kids to plasma pores physics. Um, and <laughs> honestly, these are just flying plots. Uh, I, I really, when I heard about this project, when I heard them talking about the project, I thought there's no way this is going to enthuse school students because you look at a, a line plot of magnetic field data and it's seemingly uninspiring, um, but it worked. And, uh, and they found loads of cool stuff about Earth's plasma pores, which is a region around the Earth. In fact, Michaela also did a project similar to this on the plasma force. Um, and here is some UV imagery of this region around the earth um, where there's a drop off in the plasma, basically. There's like a, a line, a, a strong line where you get a drop off in the density of the plasma around the earth. Um, so you can do plasma related earth magnetosphere topics. Um, we've done comet topics. So here's Carson. He did, um, he got the school students to study these lines, these striae existing comets and so he got lots and lots of um, images of comets from uh, some from non-professional astronomers and and got the school students to to study these striae and understand how they formed and um, and how they unform. <laughs> um, Ali Francis had his students doing some machine learning to look at craters on the surface of Mars and they produced a whole catalog that's published in this um, of craters on the surface of Mars. Uh, or lots of aurora projects. Uh, so Ophelia works on X-ray and UV data and got her students to study structures in, in Jupiter's northern lights. Um, lots of machine learning topics. I'll show a video of the students talking about these in a second. Um, but here is Sarah, Claire and Jasmine. They're at Northumbria University. So we've actually become multi-institutional now and, and spread beyond UCL. Um, and they were using lots of machine learning techniques to look at these things called ULF waves, which are ultra low frequency waves, they're vibrations of the magnetic field um, and using random forests and stuff to study these. Uh, loads of exoplanet observations. So we've been really lucky um, to have partnerships with La Cumbra Global Observatory and uh, through the Fawkes Telescope Network. 
and so lots of people, so like Hannah Osborne, Cynthia Ho, um, Billy Edwards, <laughs> um, Sam Wright, Gordon Yip, loads, loads of exoplanet people have been, um, have partnered with schools and got school students to take their own observations of exoplanets and then use UCL tools to study the transits of exoplanets. So things like this. Uh, this is with WASP 122 data that they took. Um, and lots of publications have popped out of that. Uh, more machine learning stuff. Uh, XML that I've talked about already. Okay, I'm just going to show some footage because I've probably talked enough and I think what's probably more useful is to see some some videos of, of kids uh, talking about this stuff. So this is Preston Manor School. It's a school in uh, Wembley. It's pretty rough. I think the pupil premium, sorry, pupil premium is the number of kids from low-income backgrounds, refugees in care um, who yeah, so the pupil premium percentage is somewhere around 60%. So lots of kids from low income backgrounds at school. Here's them explaining um, from their final presentation what a spectrogram and what ion data looks like. Basically. From the data we collected, we formed nine clusters, and those clusters were formed through, through variables like ion temperatures and such. The distribution you see on the right isn't as complicated as it might look. There are three different variables you might have to take into account. Uh, the one on the right is the color distribution. It's supposed to measure ion density. So if it's red or dark red, there would be more ions in that specific region. And if it's blue, there's less ions in that region. Pitch angle on the y-axis, you can see essentially telling us the location of the ion where we're looking at. For example, 180 degrees would be moving opposite to the magnetic field lines of the Earth. And zero degrees would be moving along it. And the four more clusters, the four more ion distributions you see is four examples of the clusters we found. The x-axis is the energy in electron volts. And that measures essentially how much energy is in each ions in that region. To interpret the distribution, the, the huge data distribution you see on the right, it is an anisotropic distribution, meaning most ions reside at 180 degrees or zero degrees, meaning along or opposite the magnetic field lines, as you can see the red being distributed. And the rest of the distributions on this slide display four of the main clus clusters the autoencode code is created with the data given. The encircled region over there shows the most dense ion region in that cluster. As with the next one, shows an isotropic, isotropic distribution because there's an even distribution. Uh, if you can see straight lines along all pitch angles. And as with all the rest, it just shows you where it is. And the last one, if you can see, is it's very dense between 100 and 1,000 electron volts. Analyzing the main populations. We use plots like this to... Okay, I'll, I'll stop that there. Um, but I guess what I was trying to get across with this video is quite the, the complexity of the material that they're, they're grappling with, um, that they're dealing with these plasma populations. They're talking about how the plasma moves relative to the magnetic field line, they're dealing with spectrograms, and they're able to analyze these spectrograms and interpret the data uh, to a high level. And this is a, a 16 year old doing this. Um, so um, another project is uh, the Jupiter's Aurora project. So this is uh, Daisy, who is um, Polish and actually English is her second language. Um, and so she's talking about some of the stuff that they found in Jupiter's Aurora. Uh, I'm just going to take it back to 6.5. Okay. Along or near the arc, as can be seen. Our group found a more unique observation with many arc structures, including a dawn side arc, which has not previously been noted. Typical dusk side structures. The main oval can split into a small section that forks off. It often also splits, leaving a gap in the middle, as shown. Another common structure is when the high emission area has receded to a smaller section. X-rays in the gap. The gap is the section between the dusk and the dawn side where the most commonly aren't UV emissions, but there are X-rays in this gap, not just in the north, but also in the south. Future directions. Okay, I'll, I'll leave Daisy there. Um, and so, and so, finally, again, just to demonstrate the diversity of different projects. 
So this was one run by um, Osnat, who's in the Science and Technology Studies group at, um, at UCL. And her group were, um, this is very much sociology of science and, and understanding um, who does science and why they do science and things like that. And so her group were asked to uh, explore how they thought attitudes to astronomy had changed during lockdown. Um, and so I'll play uh, about a minute of this as well. In my research, I focused on ages from 16 year olds to 24 year olds and how their use of social media impacted their attitudes towards astronomy during lockdown. I found that because of the because of the increased interest in astrology and the astrology boom on social media like TikTok, people associated astronomy with astrology and this led to the increasing interest in astronomy as well and it became more popular during lockdown. However, it was more interesting to see that this link also caused um, the credibility of astronomy to decrease and as people associated astronomy with being less rational. Um, so hi, my name is Sama, and for my research project, I aim to explore the links between increased, increasing secularization and interest in astrology with this new phenomenon of increased interest in astronomy throughout 2020. And so for my research project, I aim to investigate over the span of four generations um, to, you know, widen my demographic and for comparative reasons. And just to do a survey consisting of 18 closed and open-ended questions, encompassing themes like religion, spirituality and science to gather data specific to my hypothesis. Um, and so my key finding that uh, solidified half of my hypothesis was a intertwined, oh sorry, someone's side, was an intertwined um, interest, spiking interest for astrology and astronomy among Gen Z throughout 2020, as opposed to the absence of this same trend amongst the Gen Z and baby boomer, I mean um, among the millennial and baby boomer demographic. And I say half of my hypothesis because the um. Okay, so uh, I think actually this is probably, I'll probably, I'm just conscious of time and maybe I, I want to allow for some discussion. So I'll, I'll probably close there and just summarize by saying that um, at UCL we're really fortunate to have so many amazing researchers and so many researchers who are willing to give their time in this manner. Um, but there is, it does seem like it's having a really profound impact on the school students who are involved. Uh, and I think that's borne through with some of the evaluation that we're showing and, and the increases in students from, from groups who've been historically excluded from science actually being able to take part in science, both in the sense of being involved in the research here, but then also taking science to the next level. Um, so, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll close with this summary um, and just say that we have so, so many schools that really want to get involved in this and we currently don't have enough researchers to be able to pair up with them. And so if there's any aspect of this that you think would be interesting, then I'd, I'd love to speak with you more about it and we'll try and work out a way to um, make your research accessible to school students and, and make this happen. Um, so, and even if you don't feel like you have enough, you, you can commit to going to the school hourly for um, for a couple of terms, uh, sorry, weekly for an hour uh, for a couple of terms, then um, I'm sure there are like other ways that that we could get you involved. So yeah, so feel free to like ping me an email after this on this or, or find me on Twitter, that's two underscores there. Um, yeah, I'd love to speak with you more if you're interested in getting involved. And even if you're not interested in getting involved, I'd love to speak with you more. <laughs> I'll leave it there, thanks.